Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's score workshop. This one is uh, how to achieve, um, I'm sorry, I have the wrong title, Kathy's old title on here, but we'll call it anyway. It's <laughs> Achieve Independence through, for, uh, through Franchising, and it's uh, sponsored by Franznet. And my name is Jerry Smith. I'm a score mentor with the Piedmont chapter. I'll be monitoring the, the, the chat window today. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask and we'll get to them probably as we go along. Uh, we only go to small groups, so uh, feel free to, uh, to ask questions and uh, we'll make it as interactive as possible. If you guys aren't familiar with SCORE, we're a nonprofit organization, a resource partner of the SBA, and we're 100% volunteer based. Uh, SCORE basically has two main areas of focus. Uh, one that we're mostly known for is our one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and that's done by experienced business owners and executives. And then, you know, sort of what you're seeing today here are uh, educational workshops. <clears throat> the bottom line message is that SCORE's here to help local small business in any way that we can. And if you like more information, the best place to, uh, to go is to our website. It's uh, piedmont.score.org. From there, you can see a list of the other workshops that are coming up and also that link to uh, request a mentor if you're interested in that. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Kathy Petcash from FranNet. Kathy is a franchise specialist in South Carolina and has been helping individuals obtain their business ownership dream for over 10 years. By following FranNet's proven research process, you'll safely and efficiently find the right business specifically for you. And um, yeah, I'm really glad that you, you guys are taking the time to, uh, to learn about franchising. It, it really is a nice option for many entrepreneurs and it's often open, uh, excuse me, often overlooked. Uh, so I really uh, hope you enjoy uh, today's workshop. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Jerry. Hello, everyone. And as Jerry said, thanks for dialing in. Um, whether we love it or not love it, we're hooked on Zoom still. So hopefully pretty soon we'll be able back to uh, live webinars. But um, yeah, Jerry said, the name of this is uh, Obtaining Your Independence Through Franchise Ownership. And I have done one like that before with Jerry. I've changed the title on this and changed the content some because of what's happening in our business world today. So becoming a franchise owner may be a career option for you to consider in 2022. And that's where we're gonna go with this today. And as Jerry said, please, uh, uh, put in a chat question, raise up your hand. Um, it's much better when I get some questions and I don't have to listen to me the whole time. So thank you very much, Jerry, and we'll just proceed. Um, I am Kathy Petcash. I have been working with FranNet, a franchise consulting firm, for about 15 years, Jerry, and that was after I left the corporate world. I was with Hewlett Packard for many years and, uh, quote, retired and decided Oh, I'm too young to retire and I'm bored. So I actually bought a flower shop and uh, I like to talk about that because I didn't have any experience in designing flowers. I love flowers, but it's, it's a key factor of what I wanna talk about today in when you open a business, buy a franchise or some way start your own business, you should be working on the business not in the business. I hired designers who were excellent and who could do the bouquets a lot better than me. If I had to do a bouquet, I really panicked. But um, working in, uh, excuse me, working on the business means that you are taking care of the marketing, the uh, community involvement, hiring the employees, ordering the supplies, you're doing all the back office and you are the face to the community for your business. So that's really what you should be focusing on as a business owner. Uh, who is FranNet? Well, as I said, we're a franchise consulting firm, an international firm, been around for 30 plus years. I think we're about into our 35th year. And we specialize in having locally based consultants throughout major cities and in all the states in Canada. So when we um, work with you to help you understand what franchising is and help you discover a business that you might really enjoy, we like to have one-on-one -on -one meetings. And again, I've always had sit down in-person meetings and I've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings over the last couple of years, but there are some people who are comfortable and I'm happy to come up to Greenville and 
and I'm down in Charleston, and uh, work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Our services are free. There are no fees to our clients. And I uh, do want to emphasize the national partnerships we have with SCORE and the SBDC. Basically, what our firm does is we match individuals who want to be in business with a franchise opportunity that meets their goals. And that would be both financial, professional, and personal goals. And I really emphasize the personal too, because if you're making this step into owning your own business, let's make sure it fits into your, your lifestyle, which might be different than what kind of lifestyle you had in the corporate world, perhaps traveling a lot like I did with Hewlett Packard. So one of the first things I want to do, I find I get in the middle of my presentations and I'm using these terms and it's like, oh, wait a minute, let, let me define some terms as we get started that I'm going to be using throughout the presentation today. What is exactly a franchise? Well, a franchise is basically a business license that you obtain from the franchisor, which allows you to use their name and trademarks. It's an established business that the franchisor has put together processes and business systems. So you, when you invest in this business, basically you pay a franchise fee to buy the license. You also get the rights to sell their products and or services. The big thing here, I believe, is their business systems that you have access to. If you start your own business, you're going to have to set up your websites, define a marketing program, decide on the skill sets you need for your employees, understand your customer base in the industry. The beauty in a franchise is the franchisor, if you don't have that specific industry experience, will train you and help you. And so all the work they've done up front, you get the license to use. As I said, you will pay an initial franchise fee. That can be anywhere from 30,000 up to, I think the highest I saw was 125. Don't panic. Uh, it was a very special case. Usually I see between 30 and 50,000 is the franchise fee for the license to become a franchisee. Um, to distinguish between the franchisor and the franchisee, when you invest in the license for a business, you are the franchisee for that franchise, the business. Franchise and franchisor is kind of used interchangeably, um, but they're, they're the ones that has set up all the systems, established the business so that you have a proven business model to follow when you become an owner, an individual owner. I hope that will help us as we go through. Kathy, can I just make a comment on that as well? Back to that, that business system that you said, that, that is so critical, guys. Uh, it, as you're looking at your options, becoming a, uh, a startup entrepreneur on your own versus that you're looking at franchising as, as, uh, as uh, Kathy will be able to describe throughout the presentation, that's the one thing that you'll be missing uh, as uh, just you're starting up yourself. Uh, that's your operating procedures, as Kathy mentioned, the, the marketing materials, even down to you know, your, uh, your, your, the pricing and things like that. These are things that uh, the typical entrepreneur, they got to sort of learn and there's this trial and error and there's costs associated with that trial and error. So as Kathy explains, you know, these startup fees and, and the licensing, um, yes, there, there's costs there, but some of that can be, uh, can be compared to mitigating some of the risk that's going on at, um, on your own. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And that's, that's really a, a critical component of the, the whole franchise process from, from, you know, from my point of view. Jerry, yeah. Um, actually, as you pointed out, all these marketing, the pricing, I love your comment on that. Even the job descriptions for your employees, what, what kind of person do I need to work for me? That's what you're paying for. You are, this franchise has already established that and they're going to hand that over to you and coach you and support you as you go forward. Um, so you think, oh, but that's going to cost more money. It is. But as Jerry pointed out, the time and expense you're going through if you're starting a business from scratch is costly. So um, you have that, that proven model up front. Thank you, Jerry. So what we want to talk about today, and I hope this meets your objectives, 
is job structures. And I was telling Jerry, the reason I wanted to approach it this way, because so much has changed over the last two years in the way we hold down our job. And we'll talk about that. So, well, why franchise ownership now in 2022? And I really want to point out myths and realities of franchising um, and assumptions. I'll throw that in too. People will maybe pass on franchising or they will pass on a specific opportunity because of something they've heard. Um, so I want to address those common issues that I hear and just help you understand the reality behind it. The other thing I like to emphasize is Franchise are not just food. And if I said, tell me a name of a franchise, what would everyone say? I'm sure most people are gonna say, um, I forgot the name, <laughs> McDonald's, right? Um, which is a great system to understand um, and the way the processes and the back office and how they've been successful over these, what, 70 years? Uh, so it's a great model to look at um, pretty expensive to get into. So we will probably look at other opportunities besides just food. And I'm going to give you other specific examples and, and people in the Greenville area who have started businesses that are not food. Then, okay, so there's opportunities out there, but how do I select the right option for myself? And the, the emphasis here is on you. What is a great business for you may not be a great business for me because of our personal goals, our financial goals, and how we will be challenged on the job. So we want to emphasize that too. And in selecting your perfect business for you, we're going to talk about building your own personal business model. Okay, that's where we're going. So post-COVID, I say that, maybe I ought to put that in quotes because I hope I'm not jumping the gun, but I'm hoping we are in a post-COVID environment now. But what's happened with our jobs that those structures have changed? Many companies have now set up work from home approaches that you do not have to go into the office. And a lot of people have gotten comfortable with that. Uh, a lot of people are now saying, I'm not going back into the office, why should I? So it's, it's a change in work environment, job structure, and it may or may not be what your ideal is, but it has changed. Zoom meetings, as I said, whether we love them or are really getting tired of them, they're out there. And it's, it's shown us another way that we can have major meetings. FranNet has um, semi-annual conferences where all of our consultants get together and also uh, a big majority, about 100 of our franchises that we represent get together. That's a huge conference. Over the last two years, we have done everything via Zoom. And that was painful at times, but it was productive and, and we achieved our goal. Um, and I will say, thankfully, hopefully, keeping my fingers crossed, this April, we will have our first live meeting in two years. So the other thing that's changed is commute. You know, when you think about it, that means more productive time for yourself because you are working from home and you don't have to get tied up in the traffic. Saves gas too. If you are an individual who has had to travel like I did with Hewlett Packard, you know, travel has stopped. I mean, what's scary is the airline industry and how it's been impacted on a lot of industries, but it's all, coming back to a better work-life balance. Even what you're wearing every day. We used to have casual Friday. Well, every day is casual. And you know, from here down, I have on my pajama bottoms, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> so our lifestyle through our work has changed and people are rethinking, do I wanna go back to work? I'm comfortable with my life now, how I can go to the kids' games, um, I don't have to, I mean, look at the money we saved in clothes, <laughs> not having to buy the clothes. Look at the money we saved in gas. So people are rethinking how they want their job structure and how they want to sustain their, their living and their family. Um, just the interaction with the, with the children, I know has changed. Now that hasn't always been real great. I feel I don't have children myself, but understanding how my my brothers and their spouses have had to 
you know, juggle the interaction with the kids and learn how to teach them. It, it's been a challenging year. And because of those challenges, you know, people are saying, well, should I look into starting my own business? And I'm hearing this from my clients. Um, and, and what they're doing is reassessing their work style and their lifestyle. How do they want to go forward with this? And what is possible that perhaps they hadn't seen in the past? They're also reevaluating their job security versus income security. Are those two separate things? How can we improve one or the other? And we are resetting our goals professionally. Uh, how do I want to be challenged financially? How much money do I want to make? And am I making it? And am, is the future correct in my job for all I get there? Is it going to be more layoffs? It's going to be another COVID. People are just rethinking. And then personal, like I said, um, having more time with their kids and their families has become even more, I won't say more important, but they've reevaluated how they might do that. So in resetting our work and our life goals in 2022, you know, people are asking themselves, and what I ask you is, what's important to you? Is flexibility in your job structure? Is um, money financially, can you obtain that in running your own business? And a big thing I hear is control and independence. <clears throat> people want control of their life, their work style, um, and they want to be their own boss. And doing that does bring them independence, um, more independence than working for the, for the boss. But it's not always right for everyone, but it's, I would, as you're reflecting, really identify what your goals are in, in looking at a business. Well, start a new business? Well, that always sounds risky, but um, what about what's happened over the last couple of years? There's a lot of businesses that had to be shut down temporarily or co uh, closed all the way. Well, this is true. And when we talk about buying a business, we're gonna take that under consideration. I remember I always said uh, a great business, if you wanna be a, a part-time owner, would be hair salons. Uh, you hire the salons, the cosmetologist, and they manage the people that work for them. And you know, you're still gonna put 10 to 15 hours maybe doing the back office operations, but I always thought this was a great no-brainer. Everyone has to have their hair cut, can't buy it on the internet. But what happened? Hair salons cut down. I have a gentleman in um, Columbia has three super cuts and he had to shut down for a while. He also told me at the very onset, he said, you know, it's, it's a lot of our employees are not feeling safe coming into the salon to take care of the public who's coming in and perhaps spreading the COVID virus. So again, is people rethinking their careers and how they're running their jobs. So this is all true, it's a fact, and we have to address that. And um, there are some businesses though that have actually thrived, sustained, and have done quite well during the last couple of years. Let's talk about that. First of all, there's three categories that I suggest people look at when they want to look at ones that perhaps are less risky. And one of them is uh, businesses that are driven by the demographics. And one of my top ones I always tell people, you know, let's talk about this. It may or may not be a good option for you. But businesses like senior care, and when I say um, based on the demographics, the seniors, my mother just celebrated her 91st birthday, bless her heart. Um, and she still lives at home independently, but she does have senior care services coming in, helping her um, a few hours every day. So that is going to continue to be an uh, quote, issue or a need as we progress. And so senior care, I think, is an excellent business to consider. Now, some people tell me, and this is what I'm saying, it may be an excellent business for someone else, but I've had people say, Kathy, I don't mean to be rude, but being around seniors really depresses me. Or perhaps they've just had a, a, a major loss in their family and, the, and they just can't emotionally handle that. So that's when we start talking about your personal goals. The other businesses that have thrived, <clears throat> excuse me, during the last two year, 
is home services. And this is why. We're all sitting at home now doing Zoom meetings and taking care of our business. And instead of being in the office, we're looking around at that carpet that needs to be replaced, the windows that need to be washed. And people have made investments in their homes over the last um, two years. Um, I myself have had my windows washed, my house painted inside and out, and I um, had landscaping done. And I also <laughs> had an addition done to my house. So, you know, the, the essential services, the ones that the government declared as essential services have done really well over the last two years. And when we talk about this, uh, just essential services, the one business in this category that I love to talk about is disaster recovery. This is really a horrible flooding home here, but these are businesses that is definitely need-based. When, when the hurricane comes through South Carolina or tornadoes or smoke or fire, disaster recovery comes in and uh, cleans up the mess, so to speak. There's the, um, the structure itself from fire, smoke, water, whatever, and there's also a business that we represent that takes care of all the upholstery, <clears throat> all the art, and all the electronics. So there's different ways, but when a disaster strikes in your home, you have to have it taken care of. That's why this is another one of my favorite businesses because need-based and um, we can't escape it. The third area that people don't think of very often is business to business, B2B, are businesses helping other businesses be successful? And the one I have here that I like is digital marketing. And why is that? Well, over the last two years, businesses have had to relook at the way they run their business, especially in the marketing, also in the hiring. Um, gyms, a lot of gyms had to close down temporarily. So what did the businesses do? They started offering online classes. And I've been very pleased to see that the franchises that I represent have done exactly that. They have um, set up online classes. They've refocused on how they market their businesses. And this is part of the service and the support you get from a franchisor that, yes, you're paying a royalty for every month. But this is why you don't have to reexamine that. They're going to do it for you. And like I said, I have been very impressed with the way the franchisors have stepped up to that responsibility and helped individual franchisees sustain their business during this COVID pandemic. So, okay, Kathy, that sounds really risky, uh, starting a business overall, but is now really the time? Well, anytime you invest in a franchise, the one thing that you can be comfortable with is what they have is the franchise disclosure document. That's for your protection that the Federal Trade Commission requires every franchise to actually document. And in that document, they tell you the history of the franchise. How did they get started? Who started it? What are the owner's experience? Why are they good at, at running this franchise? If there's ever been any litigation, it has to be documented. It's going to explain all the costs that it's going to cost you to start this franchise. There's no surprise. Lots of times when you're starting a business from scratch, you're discovering, well, how much do I have to pay on, on my marketing? And what should I expect as far as leasing a building? So those are all itemized in the FDD for your information and your protection. Uh, when you buy a franchise, you will have a specific territory that they will assign to you that you will invest in, and they promote, promote and promise that they will not put in another franchisees to compete with you in your exclusive territory. Um, all the franchisees that are out there in the system, they are in the FDD, and part of the process that I lead you through during your research is putting you in contact with franchisees that have similar backgrounds than you, that um, maybe live in an area with similar demographics as you, so that you can really talk to people that are doing it now and understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, 
And you get to ask them, you know, how is the support from the franchisor? So this is all good information to have. Um, that's the reason I like franchising is because you have this at your fingertips and not having to figure it out on your own. So yes, it's risky, but this is what the government requires all franchisors to put out for your protection. Okay, let's talk about these myths and set those aside so you get the real story, okay? Well, as I said earlier, it's not just food. Can you believe that sign up there, 15 cents for a hamburger? <laughs> but uh, now they're giving, aren't they giving uh, all sodas or a dollar a piece or something like that? So anyway, what are some other opportunities out there? Well, there's over 3,600 franchise companies across 90 different industries. So that's quite a shopping list for you to pick from. When we develop your business model, that will help us narrow it down. But here's some, again, that are some of my favorites. I mentioned seniors, children. Why is that on my list? Because even during the pandemic, people took care of their kids, found a way to entertain them. They took them camping, invested in camping equipment, uh, education. The approach to educating our, our children changed. Like I said, we had online classes now. And our tutoring franchises have done really well uh, by adapting a lot of their classes to online. Okay, here's my favorite. I have a standard poodle and I won't tell you how much money I spend on to get her groomed every month. But um, pets was in the, um, in, in the required businesses that you had that they allowed them to stay open the grooming. Um, I love telling the story about my franchisee here in Charleston. I think it's, I think he's working on his fifth year now. He started out with one van, one groomer. He's got 10 vans and 10 groomers right now. And he tells me, Kathy, the issue is I can't get to all my clients. And he has, you know, put a hold on bringing in new clients, new pets, because he's so busy. Um, as I said earlier, professional services. The reason I like professional services is sometimes people are a little uh, leery or scared to walk out of their comfort zone, especially if they've been in business. So if that is, if you wanna run your own business and you would like to stay in the consulting or the professional services, there are business opportunities out there in franchising. You will also find that the investment for professional services is gonna be much less than a food establishment because you're working from home. You don't have the food, the, you don't have the employees. There's several reasons that the professional services, I'll say you can even get into some of those for 70,000 total in versus a food concept. Like I have simple food concepts over here. They're probably gonna start at around 200, 250 because you still have the overhead, the lease, the employees. Um, and I'm saying simple here because they're not a full-fledged restaurant with a full-fledged kitchen. You know, think of the yogurt shops, think of the um, ice cream, think of the salad places. Um, those are all ones that are a very simple concept and a lot less expensive than maybe a half a million up to a couple million for McDonald's. Uh, the beauty industry, home services, as I said before, it's been very, very successful over the last two years. Other industries are fitness. They have set up a lot of online, but I still like that industry. Automotive, talk about a need-based. John Hilton had a couple of weeks ago and had a flat and I went in, just walked in. I didn't I walked in after I limped to the, the tire place and they were just sitting there telling me that, you know, they, they're just like so busy. And it's like, I gotta get home tonight. So they did squeeze me in, but. Automotive is still and always will be going strong. We have to take care of our cars. Landscaping, and then as I said, disaster recovery. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. What I'd like to share is some of the um, opportunities, businesses, franchises that people have invested in. Um, Flyfo, which is a, a mosquito um, business, gentleman up in Greenville invested in that about December of last year. So he's been running for about a year. 
Um, and this one is hoping to open up in the Greenville area in March. Um, Physical Therapy and Balance Centers. And the reason the lady I worked with liked this business was because it was in an area that involves seniors. I mean, there's a lot of just you and I, I had to go through physical therapy when I dislocated my shoulder uh, year, last year, but there's a lot of seniors that go in there too, especially the balance in our part of it. So these are two in your Greenville area, look them up. Uh, this is Ozzy Petmobile that I was telling you about, the gentleman with the tin band. He's here in Charleston. Here's another one that just started, well, actually he invested last July and he it will be opening in, uh, he's hoping to open in March. So one thing you're going to catch on to this is these businesses that are brick and mortar, a location is going to take you longer to get started because you have to find the location, you have to do the build out. Um, but again, with the franchisor, they help you find that ideal location. Do you need foot traffic? Do you need car traffic? Do you need to be in a strip mall next to a, an anchor, like a grocery store? So they're going to help you determine where's the best place to put these. Another one that just started this, um, do, 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 they started in the summer. They, they invested actually in April, I believe, last year. And it's Bridge to Better Living. And that is helping seniors and their families find the next um, place for their senior to move. Like I said, my mom's still in the home living independently. You know, if a time comes when we need to put her in assisted living, this would be a great resource for us to use to help identify the facility that is best for them, taking into consideration their, their dietary needs, their physical needs, their social needs. So these are all ones that um, are, I have helped here in the South Carolina area. I'm very pleased with the results. It's not all about food. There's no food on this slide. <laughs> okay, it's all about food. No, it's not. How about, oh my gosh, franchises are expensive. Let's talk about that. Well, in reality, you're gonna have a total investment that the franchisor has to document no surprises in the FDD that we discussed. So they're going to have, okay, this business is going to cost $500,000, but they will usually give you a range because depending if you're in New York City or in Greenville, South Carolina, your rent and other factors may apply that gives you to really quote a range of the investment. So that's your protections that you'll know up front versus if you're starting a business on your own with a healthy store, you're going to have to help understand what are going to be all your expenses and what is it going to cost you. Um, what's interesting as far as total cost, if you look at the 3,600 different businesses that I talked about, only 20% of those cost over over a half a million dollars. Like I said, the McDonald costs about $2 million. So that means what 80% of that 3,600 you can get into for less than a half a million. And what I like are these, um, like right in here, this 28%, those are ones from 100 to 250. And I noted here that my clients, the average of everyone I work with Usually it's about 150 total investment in. Now, people are saying, but gosh, Kathy, 150,000. Well, again, this is for people who are thinking about starting a business. And if you're starting a business, whether you're starting it on your own or buying a franchise, hopefully you've done a very um, good analysis of your financial situation to see if you can do this. What I'm gonna do is help guide you and help you understand what is your what would be your comfort zone in investment do not do not borrow too much money and there are businesses here as i'm showing you anywhere from 50,000 on up that we can find the best spot for you to consider in your analysis and looking at franchise opportunities if you're going to buy a quote brick and mortar uh, a hair salon like the physical fitness the gym a retail store, even some pet supply stores. I mean, my client bought a mobile one, so he had to buy 
vans. But if you're investing in a brick and mortar, the investment's going to be more because of that lease space. If you're investing in a service business, um, like the, the painters, okay, I have a gentleman here who opened a painting business. And by the way, he was a major executive with um, Ford in Chicago. He relocated uh, for, quote, retirement here in Charleston and was quickly bored. So he wanted a business. And he bought a painting franchise. Now, how the heck did he go from a major marketing executive at Ford to buying a painting franchise? Well, he wanted to keep his investment low. He had a lot of savings, but he didn't want to spend it all. So he is working from home. He has contractors that he manages. He does the customer satisfaction. When I was getting ready to paint my house, he came out. He helped me with the color selection. He came in and I had these paint splotches all over my house. And I love what he said. This is what he's learned. He said, Kathy, you need to narrow that down to two or three instead of the 10 you have on your walls. So, you know, the franchisor has helped coach him in understanding how to close that cell. I was very impressed with him. So um, just keep that in mind that there's different ranges. And you, I tell my clients, I had someone come in and say, I just inherited a million dollars. So I'm going to buy a business. I said, well, congratulations, but we don't have to spend a million dollars. So I am going to try to find you the best business that meets your goals for the less money. Okay. So, oh my gosh, just like, like my client who bought the painting business, most people think you have to have experience in the industry that you're investing in. Well, what a franchisor is really looking for is what have you developed over the years? This gentleman was excellent. He was a marketing director in sales and marketing. That is what he's going to take into his business, how to market and sell his business services. Maybe you've had experience in customer service. Maybe you love interacting with the customers and solving their problems. I have a lot of people come in and say, I love solving problems. And I'm going, okay, let's translate that into running your own business. Maybe you're an, uh, an HR, a financial person in your business, and I, what I call back office. Um, you know, you can bring that expertise into working on your business and hiring the individuals to actually do the painting, do the grooming or whatever. And then operations and management. Management is key. So these are skill areas in your career where you, when you write your resume, this is what you focus on. Well, what about other skills that you need? Keep in mind that the franchisor is going to train you, whoops, went too fast there, I'm sorry. Is gonna train you the new franchisee on the industry overall and their internal systems that they have set up that they are going to pass on to you and train you and support you. They're going to train you. And what I like is they're going to train you not only on running that individual business, they're going to train you so you understand the industry you're entering in. So what they're really looking for is your business and management skills. Yes, you know, have you, if you're going to buy a business with five to 10 employees, you hopefully have had some management experience. And you do need a basic understanding of financial statements. SCORE is a great resource for you. And in the classes that Jerry pointed out that they present to young entrepreneurs or people wanting to start their business, you really do need that and you can get that. Here is one that is so important. They're looking at your people skills. How do you interact, not only with your customer, but with your employees? Let me tell you a quick little story here. I'm watching my time because sometimes I get involved with my stories. <laughs> but when I owned the flower shop, I had worked for Hewlett Packard and I had technical employees that worked for me. All of a sudden, I'm moving to a new community in Southern Georgia and I have very uh, specific skilled people in the in the decor okay uh, is that right side or left side I always get them mixed up but totally different side of the brain than what I was used to and you know what it was a challenge I had to 
redo my brain to think how to interact with these people, how to speak their language, and how to slow myself down from deadlines and, and spreadsheets and project management into communication and understanding their approach to being successful for the flower shop. So it was, uh, and I tell people that, that, I'll say, well, what is your management experience? Have you ever managed employees? Oh yeah, I can manage anyone, I'm comfortable. And um, I tell them my story. I had another gentleman who was like the top sales rep for a pharmaceutical company in the US and he wanted to start a business. And I asked him that, oh, Kathy, I can, you know, I've worked with people. I, I, I'm fine. <clears throat> a month after he started his business, he bought a cell phone repair store. Had technical people with him again, right? <clears throat> and he said, I am even going to fire all my people or I'm going to sell this franchise. And that was within 30 days of him opening. And I had to, I said, what's wrong, Joe? And he says, I'm not used to managing someone with a 30 to $50,000 salary. I'm used to managing people with a hundred to $200,000 salary. I said, it's different, isn't it? And he goes, yeah. And so we worked, we got that under control, but it's like, you really need to understand who you're gonna be comfortable with. And again, work on scoops, work on the business managing it versus in the business. You're not painting, you're not fixing the cell phones, you're not washing the dogs. Um, you're not even doing the cleanup in the homes for disaster recovery. Very, very key. So how do you identify the best franchise for you? Not for me, but for you. Well, first, some common sense. As I said earlier, 150,000 is still a lot of money, right? Well, you need to determine your net worth. Watch your total assets your home, your cash, your savings, your cars, and what is the debt that you apply to that to come up with your net worth? Franchisors are gonna have net worth requirements and they're gonna have liquidity requirements, meaning how much cash do you have on hand if you need to get your hands on it? Because they know how much money you're gonna to need to be successful in this business. They do not want you to go out of business. They wanna grow their franchises they want to expand their market share and their branding. And that's why they bring on franchisees. So they are going to work with you and me to help you understand what, what will be successful based on your net worth. Know your living expenses. Know your gas, your rent, your house payment, your clothing, your education. Understand what your living expenses are and do not plan to cover those living expenses in your first year of business. You're getting established. So you've got to have some buffer over here as you start your business. That will help you establish what your investment level should be. Then we're also then going to build your business model. More on that in a minute. But when you get into your research, 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 ask questions. Uh, don't disregard a business just because Oh, I've heard this. I've heard that um, these are too expensive. I've heard that you have to have industry experience, all those myths we talked about and assumptions and get advice from the right people. Here's where you need to go score. They will, they've helped several of my clients and um, a very valuable free asset for you there. Now you'll talk to your family right? You'll talk to your friends. That's okay. You're going to do that, but you're going to get their assumptions and you're going to get these horror stories of, oh my gosh, my neighbor's uncle's son started that business and he failed. Well, <laughs> that's far removed from you. And why did he quit fail? So um, probably wasn't following the processes. Probably, probably, on yes. the, uh, the last slide, if you can go yes, back sir. and peek uh, well, first, uh, Monica uh, is going to be uh, uh, taking off in a little bit, but she wants to connect with you. So I'll send you uh, her, her contact info from the, uh, from the note here. Okay. Uh, as you were talking about the, uh, the research component, as you mentioned several slides back, the, um, the ability to actually talk to the other franchisees, people who have been doing this exact business in some sort of similar geography, and to ask them questions, that's so crucial that you, 
you don't get that opportunity um, if you're going out of the loan without a franchise. So I just wanted to reinforce that part of it that I thought is uh, particularly helpful. Thank you. This is very true. Um, okay. So how to succeed, follow those processes that the franchisor has already established and you have the right to. Uh, why do people fail? <laughs> because lots of times they go off, well, I'm gonna do it this way. I used to do this and, I'm, and they don't follow the processes. Um, that will get you in trouble most of the time. Uh, work on the business, not in the business. Hire the people, sell their services, make money, and you take care of running that day-to-day -day business. Here's something else. Don't buy a business just because you like the product or the service. A lady once came to me and she wanted to open a Cold Stone Creamery. And I said, why? And she said, well, my husband loves ice cream. That is not the reason <laughs> to buy a, a Cold Stone Creamery. What about, do you want to manage teenagers? Do you want to be open seven days a week? Do you want to be open from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night? What about spoilage? Those are the things you need to look at in a business. Yeah, you need to like the product. You need to be comfortable in it. But what I'm saying is don't buy it just because of the product. And here's the biggest way you can fail, borrowing too much money. Okay, so how much money am I going to need if I said it's 100, let's say $200,000? If you're going to borrow money, uh, usually you're going to need 25 to 30%. The bank will require your skin in the game. So that means, well, I can do math better with a $100,000 investment. That means, you know, maybe... 70, 75,000, uh, you're going to need to finance and perhaps you want to have this already in your pocket to be able to invest. How do I get that money? Well, your savings. Oh, be careful with this one. Friends, relatives are a partner. There's two kinds of ships you don't want to be on and that's a sinking ship and a partnership, but we can talk about that later. Um, home equity line of credit that's already sitting there with your home, SBA loans. Um, there is also ways to use your IRAs, your 401k, people leaving uh, other corporate businesses will do this. I see probably 50% of my clients that do this. Um, you can actually access those monies uh, without paying taxes or penalties or interest on it from the government. And, but it's a very specific process and setup that you have to go through. And I can put you in touch with companies that will help you with that. So at FriendNet, we want to make sure that there is a safe path for you to do your research and find a business that's right for you. So the first step that we would ask you to do is to complete an entrepreneur profile. Here's the website here. And then I'm going to have a face-to-face -face or a Zoom-to-Zoom -Zoom meeting, and we're going to build your business model. I will then, of the criteria we've set up in your business model, I am going to match you or make recommendations that I feel would be good opportunities for you. Get you started on your research. I will mentor you and coach you through your research. Bring in the different professionals, legal, financial, score, counselors to help you uh, do your research and do a very good job. This again, um, my services will not cost you a fee. Here's the link again. And in this, we're gonna talk about why you wanna do this. Are you crazy? <laughs> what are your skills that you can bring to the business? What are your interests? What's your value systems? And I do run into this a lot. There's people you know, with very strong value systems that might be, the business might be in conflict with them. Um, and then let's meet after you complete that and let's find some businesses. This is a business model, and I've touched on this throughout my presentation, but employees, have you managed employees before? Do you, are you okay with one or two employees? I have a lady I'm working with now, because usually people say, oh, less employees, the better. Well, she says, I, I love mentoring and coaching and helping people succeed. She was looking for a business, you know, I'm, I'm happy with 20 employees. We talked about your budget. What is your comfort zone? What can you afford to invest in? Here's one that's different. 
I told you that your investment's going to be less if you don't have a storefront. Well, that means you might work from a home office or a very small office somewhere. But are you comfortable working from a home office? Most of us have gotten pretty comfortable over the last couple of years, but it's something to think about. Some people need to get up, put on a tie and, and, and go out every day. How many, how many hours, how many days a week do you want to be open? Are you looking for growth? Do you want multiple territories? Are you happy and it will meet your financial objectives just to have one location? Do you want your end customer to be other businesses, professionals, or are you comfortable working with the end consumer? Do you need to have a physical product to sell to be comfortable in presenting it? Or are you okay with a service? Some people like to be new. They want to be the first one out on the street with a new franchise. And if you tell me that, I'll help you find those. Okay, here's some that are wanting to come into your area. There's none here yet. I'm working with a gentleman in Columbia right now, and that's what he wanted. He wants something that, you know, I want to be first on the street. So these are things, instead of concentrating up front on the product or the ice cream, Think about the structure of your business and how you want to run it and how many hours you want to put in it every day. I really emphasize this because that will help us find the business that's best for you. We are very proud of our record at FranNet. We keep in touch with our clients to see how successful they've been. And we've been very pleased with the 91% of our franchisees that we've worked with are still in business after two years bursting across the board and starting a business on their own, it's usually about 64% after the two years. After five, we have a 85% success rate versus 50 if you're doing it on your own. The other thing that we track is how are those individuals doing within the franchise itself? We're very proud that about 15% of our clients we work with become quote, top performers. They have the best franchise in the US. Um, so those are very compelling numbers to consider in working with us, and we're very proud of them. As you start your research, here's some um, resources that you will need, and I highly recommend, and I'll put you in touch with these people. Uh, SCORE, most definitely. Um, I, I did mention, I hope I mentioned that my clients with FlyFo, the Mosquito Company, and Physical Therapy and Balance Center. Jerry, thank you. You helped both of those clients very well in helping them analyze and um, do their financials and, and put together their business plans. And I really appreciate that. Um, the um, franchise attorney, when it's time to sign the papers, you need to talk with a franchise attorney, not a real estate attorney, not a divorce attorney. Um, you need someone that understands that FDD because that thing is a big document and it's going to bore you to death. <laughs> so we want someone with a, a special eye that identifies areas that you need to be aware of, an accountant, a financial advisor. Here is a couple of books. Um, more than just French fries. I like this one because our CEO and scores, um, I don't think Ken has that position anymore, but they did co-author this book. Um, the E-Myth Revisited is by Michael Gerber. And what I like about his book is that he gives case studies of individuals that have started businesses. And a great example of this one is uh, a lady that wanted to start a bakery. She started working in it versus on it. She loved to bake, so she was going to bake and open her bakery. And Michael checked in with her a year later and said, how's it going? She goes, I got a great business, but I hate it. Don't turn your hobby into your job. And that's what she did. So just think about that. I love that book because of the case studies. Street Smart Franchising is an excellent book to give you the, the good, the bad, the, guy, um, the good, the bad, the ugly of a franchise system. Uh, excellent book. That would be my first one I'd recommend on specifically franchise. Mm -hmm. So that is the information I had for you today. Um, are there any questions in the chat box, Jerry? No, uh, no additional uh, questions, uh, Kathy. But um, okay. yeah, I mean, as usual, we covered a lot of ground in our uh, just a really, really, really nice overview of, of franchising, the, the services that, that Franet uh, provides. 
uh, and we had a, a great uh, great turnout this morning from uh, from the client side. So um, anybody who's looking to uh, to learn more about this uh, has a, or really wants to pursue this, uh, please you know, contact Kathy. If you remember a few slides back, she showed you the um, you know, some of the tools. He started off with a, a sort of a uh, evaluation tool, I guess what it is, what, uh, what Kathy provides there. And it's a uh, process that you go through together and it really helps you identify one, is this really for you? And number two, if it is, you know, what is the right direction? What are the types of franchise that might be right for you? So um, uh, let's see, we do have a couple of questions here. The uh, presentation recorded, yes, it's gonna be recorded. Give me a few days to, uh, to get it up on the, uh, the YouTube channel. Um, you know, so we'll, uh, we'll get that uh, going, we'll send a link out. And uh, you know, Kevin is asking, I'm, I'm taking Kevin that maybe you're, uh, you're younger because you're asking how old should a franchise be? Are you, ask, are you talking about yourself or are you are talking about the, the franchise in terms of uh, the age of how long it's been around? Can you clarify that, Kevin? Yeah. All right. So I'm sorry. So yeah, he's looking at the uh, how long should a franchise be around, Kathy, before you're uh, yeah maybe before you work with them or before a uh, uh, potential franchisee should be interested. Well, um, that depends. I hate that answer. But like I said, a gentleman I'm working with up in um, in Columbia, he wanted to be the first one in Columbia, so he didn't want any other there. So I showed him a brand new within the last brand new being two to three years that was just getting established had um, probably half a dozen franchisees, but he wanted to be on the cutting edge. Now that might not be for everyone. The downside on getting a business that is new is that you can't validate as much because there aren't that many franchisees that have been running it for that long. And where that was his first objective, um, once he learned that, it's like, oh, well, there's no one to talk to and they don't have a track record yet. When you buy a franchise, you know, if they have an established track record with good numbers, that really helps in your decision criteria. So it just kind of depends. Someone wants someone like, McDonald's who have been forever and is a, a brand name that's well known. So that's what we will discuss. Um, uh, I always say, be sure that there, I like track records myself. So look at how long they've been in business. Have they been in business for five years, but only have two franchisees? Well, I'm not sure about that. Why is there not more growth? So those are things to look at. Now, FranNet we don't represent every business out there. We have about, I think we have about 250 in our inventory right now, but we do pre-qualifications on them, on their financials, on their support they offer their franchisees. We actually interview franchisees and the history and the ownership of the franchise to make sure they are very well established, to make sure that the franchisee has experience in franchising, so they know what they're doing. So, you know, we'll, we'll decide in which direction is important to you that we can look at. Great, great. I, I think you answered it, uh, Kathy. You just, he just also had the comment that he's sort of looking for something that's been established for a while, let's say 15 years, but is just moving into franchising that operation. You know, Absolutely. so if you find somebody that's uh, that they knows what they're doing, they have the experience, but they're new to the maybe like your client, you're saying that uh, you have be, become one of the first ones to market in a region. So, um, OK, that's great. Um, yeah, we'll leave the, uh, the the chat window open for another uh, another minute or so. So if you guys have any uh, any further questions, uh, just go ahead and pop them in there. Um, but again, um, yeah, just, just a, another uh, great uh, presentation today. And uh, yeah, the recording will be available if anybody wants to go back and review. And uh, more importantly, uh, you know, Kathy's available. So if you guys do have interest and you want to pursue this further, uh, go ahead and, uh, and reach out. Uh, the information is on the screen right now. Um, if you're just not sure, or maybe your, your combination, or you think you may want to do something else that's not franchise related, but you're still interested in the entrepreneur process, reach out to SCORE at the website. We'll, uh, we'll get a, a mentor to, to help you out with that. Jerry, you brought up a good point. 
I will be the first to admit that franchising is not for everyone. Um, if you are a very creative person and like to do things your own way, uh, you, you probably ought to pursue that. Because when you buy a franchise, you're paying for that, those processes that establish um, success path. And you need to follow those processes. If you're not, well, then really you're kind of throwing money away. So um, yeah, it's not for everyone. To be quite honest with you, I would not be a good franchisee. Here's true confession. I understand it. I love it. But I like to break rules, okay? <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but... Um, so I bought an existing business. The flower shop was already in business. It was not a franchise. So I've got experience in experience, experience and experiencing these different scenarios. So I can help you understand, is this the right direction for you? So, such an important point. I, I, I really, I'm really glad that you stressed that because we, we use that as a sort of as a strength early on in the presentation saying, hey, you're gonna get this amazing blueprint that's proven and known, and this is this is what you're buying into. But exactly to your point, if that doesn't fit your personality and you're like, well, I sort of like the blueprint, but I'd like to change this, I'd like to change that, that's that's not gonna work. And um, I guess I got a quick question. Um, have you seen anything over, over the years of, um, maybe people with like, let's say like a military background becoming an entrepreneur, because I get to see people that have been brought up in a way that regimented follow procedure can be very uh, adept, I would imagine, at, at taking these blueprints and uh, be successful in implementing them. Most definitely. I work with the SBA. They have a boots to business um, program through um, the military. Um, worked with the SBA up in, in uh, Columbia and making presentations. Franchisors love military for just that reason. They are disciplined. They follow processes. Um, they have led people. All key characteristics of successful franchisees. The gentleman I talked about, um, or the company I talked about, who has three superstores up in Columbia, he was a he was a thirty year veteran. I had another gentleman who was a um, uh, who invested in the, help me here, oh, sign manufacturing company, very process oriented there. Um, yeah, so I've worked with veterans and like I said, franchisors love veterans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we're, uh, don't see any other questions coming into the queue. So I think we've, uh, we'll sort of wrap it up at this point. Thanks again, everybody for, uh, for joining uh, the webinar today. And if you have any questions, reach out. If you just want some more info, uh, head over to piedmont.score.org. All right, everybody, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, thank Kathy. you, Paul, and thank you, Jerry.